You know say money no be problem Honest on the block Alright, I'm back again Straight up Alright, what's up? Listen Digital Africa is booming. A dynamic startup scene is reinventing the continent. A generation of young founders is busy creating a new Africa image with innovations made for and in Africa. My name is Geraldine de Bastian. I create networks between innovators and startups worldwide and host conventions connecting people from all continents. We meet to exchange different ideas of how technology can help solve development issues and improve lives. It's been a long time since I Break open this old narrative of we here in the north or we here in the west are sort of dumping our solutions somewhere on the south and really turn that around a little bit. I'm planning to visit three countries on this trip. The first stop is Kenya. Kenya has one of the most vibrant tech scenes in Africa. I want to meet the people who shape it and learn what motivates them. In 2009, East Africa was connected to international internet backbones. Since then, the market for digital solutions has been growing. The majority of Kenyans access internet services, usually per mobile phone. How long have you been an Uber driver for? I've been driving for two years now. Two years? Yeah. And is, is there a lot of debate in uh, Kenya about Uber versus taxi drivers? Yeah, there's a big competition there. Kenya is leading in mobile payments. The SIM-based service M-Pesa was launched over 10 years ago and has since revolutionized Kenya's economy. The first place I had to meet people from the tech scene is the iHub. So this is where we have the meeting rooms and then the staff sit on this side. We have boardrooms, and then this is just where we sit. So you can sit anywhere here. The iHub used to be the meeting place of Nairobi's tech community. It supplies young innovators with internet access, training, and networking opportunities. Mugetti and Sheila have both accompanied the iHub a long way. 2017, the space was sold to a foreign investment fund. Some say a step towards professionalization. Others, a loss for the community. You could come and be together. You could talk to another person who understands what code is, what a bug is. Someone else who understands why you would quit your job to come and code and to innovate something. And you know, your parents are mad at you. So it's a support system. And you've been like the queen of mobile innovation in Nairobi for quite some time now. So how would you say that has changed? The biggest thing I think that has changed now is we have a lot of investors. But does that change the mindset of the entrepreneurs? I think people, you cannot exempt impact in Africa, luckily or fortunately, you know, because all the problems or majority of the problems that we have here, they are social types of problems. If, if it's education, for instance, if it's health, if it's um, even logistics and, yeah. and utilities, it's, it's just all around that. E-commerce is huge, but if you look at the things people are buying on the platforms, it's not entertainment-based stuff. Ushahidi is one of Kenya's big success stories. The crowd mapping platform was created in Nairobi to help during the outbreak of violence after elections in 2007-2008. Today, the open source tool is being used around the world. Angela is the community manager. working with the ordinary citizens to be the ones who are sharing first-hand reports about anything that's happening around them, right? Having them feel empowered in that they're being able to protect their vote by 
voicing out their opinions, telling us what they think, telling us what they see. And the way that we're able to raise these voices is through collection of data through various means. SMS tends to be the easiest way to actually engage with people. If you think about someone like my grandmother, she might not have access to a laptop, might not have access to a smartphone, but she has access to um, SMS. Posts can be submitted via SMS, email, Twitter, or a web form. After a verification process, the posts appear on an interactive map. The software is free for anyone to use. Humanitarian aid agencies used Ushahidi to locate survivors after the earthquake in Haiti. Activists used Ushahidi after the spill of the oil platform Deepwater Horizon. And the software was also used for election monitoring during the Kenyan national elections in 2017. 10 years after its creation. The idea behind our election monitoring um, project or this deployment was more of a preventive measure and really tapping into the collective intelligence of the crowd. Angela reports they received over 6,000 entries during the elections. During the, that electoral period, we saw a lot more security incidences happening mm -hmm. in that particular area, right? And I guess that's also like the power of open source, that mm -hmm. people can adapt Ushahidi and make a map for whatever use they have. Exactly, that it's easily, you know, it's, it's, it's easily available to everyone, you know, there aren't any barriers of entry. Open technologies like Ushahidi and open spaces play an important role in the development of Nairobi's innovation scene. I've been looking forward to visiting the Makerspace Gearbox as I've been following its development for a few years now. What started as a small corner in the iHub turned into a big industrial space, bringing together local makers and international corporations. So this is the, the main workshop and I want to start with the corner over there. Great, it's really nice to finally be here. I'm so glad to have you over. Kamau has a background in engineering and manages the makerspace. Hardware innovations are developed in different workshops. The space provides engineers and inventors with access to machines, technical support, and business advice. Uh, Brenda is our mechanical engineering lead. Hi, Brenda. <laughs> nice to meet you. There's a lack of industrial production sites and research institutions where ideas can be tested. Makerspaces can help bridge these gaps. I got a kind of tired of seeing so many good ideas not materialize in terms of not uh, crossing over into production, into, into actual manufacture. And so one of the problems that we identified is that it's very difficult to make a good quality prototype in Kenya. Kamau shows me examples of projects created in the makerspace. For instance, the 3D microscope, or the prototype built by the startup Pregmom, a digital fetoscope to monitor the baby's heartbeat in the womb. Many infants still die during childbirth in Kenya. You're starting to find companies, large companies like Philips, like Siemens, like um, uh, GE and so on, coming and saying, we need to understand exactly what the African consumer wants. So it's really a mutual knowledge it's exchange. Mutual. You learn about the process of fabrication, and they learn about what's important and what they should be producing. Exactly. And of course, there's a subtle balance between you know what you take from outside and what you have from yourself. So that's something that we're trying to strike as well. Innovation needs to come from inside. You need to be authentic. Uh, if you're coming up with new ideas. One of the projects that originated from Gearbox is Pago Energy, a startup that attracts international investments and team members. So what we've invented is a smart metering solution which allows people to have pay-per-use gas. So instead of having to buy the whole gas tank, you can basically buy the gas tank on loan and pay per use by using your meter. Exactly. They are not able to afford maybe the cooking gas and all the cylinder to pay it at once. And that's why maybe we came up with a pay per use whereby they can be able to pay any amount of money they are comfortable with. Like if in the morning you want to, to prepare a cup of tea, but you're completely out of balance, you just top up with your mobile phone 50 cents uh, to the meter and it gives you direct access to gas. Pago delivers a gas bottle, the meter, and the gas cooker. Their main target group are people living in informal settlements. <laughs> a 
smart meter measures the gas used and sends the information to the Paygo database. Customers pay via mobile money. Many people with a low income use kerosene or charcoal. These can be purchased in small quantities, but are less healthy to use. Clean gas for people on the economic bottom of the pyramid. A business model instead of a charity project. Our customer segment uses a lot of fuel. Most people are cooking three times a day, uh, so it's a very yeah, viable market segment to target. Um, so it's, it's kind of funny that m most people are staying away from it. I joined Liz and Alex on a delivery tour to Kibera, the largest informal settlement in Kenya. In a country where many people live with very little income or even below the poverty line, it's worth developing solutions targeting this market. And startups like Pego Energy show how challenges such as people not having a postal address or a bank account can be tackled. Alex uses GPS to deliver his gas bottles of clean energy to the right customer. And I buy a bottle of water for us at the kiosk and pay with M-Pesa. This, this is your agent number? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Have good. Yeah, cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Around half of the Kenyan GDP is processed by M-Pesa. There are over 100,000 agents in the country where users can pay in, take out, or transfer money to other M-Pesa accounts. From buying a bottle of water at a small shop to paying your electricity bill, M-Pesa is the standard payment tool in Kenya and even makes loans and saving small amounts possible. In the afternoon, I visit the weekly flea market at K1. Many people from Nairobi's tech scene meet here to hang out. It could be a summer afternoon in Berlin or Amsterdam, where people working in culture, arts, technology or business scenes mix. The dark side of innovation. Around six kilograms of electronic waste are produced per person each year. Whilst Europeans produce 16.6 .6 kilos, the average African produces only 1.9 kilos. Often, electronic waste is exported from Europe to Africa. Currently, only 20% of all electronic waste is recycled. The waste processed at the WE Center comes from Kenya and its neighboring countries. The center is a pioneer in the region. How much is e-waste an issue in Kenya in general? Awareness on proper disposal of electronic waste is still very low. So we create awareness for those who know that what we do, some of them will bring it here, while others we have to go and uh, collect from them. Seth, the manager from the WE Center, shows me the parts and materials the staff are extracting from the waste donated to them. And each of them are kept separately. Mm -hmm. We also have others... Like these stepper motors. These stepper motors are from... Uh, Printers, mm -hmm. and they are taken by one of the local partners who make the 3D printers. I'm actually going to go see Roy from AB3D. He's a oh. friend of mine later on today. Is it okay if I take some of these parts for him? Yes, you can. Okay, take great. Them. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. I'm taking the parts Thank to Roy you. from AB3D. We have power cables with terminals. Roy and I met through a mutual friend and are part of a network connecting makers, innovators and innovation spaces, like Gearbox and the iHub. 
His vision is to overcome supply chain problems in Kenya through 3D printing. Three D printing is a huge opportunity in countries lacking production facilities. Roy prints parts for hospitals, schools, and companies. As the printers are expensive and fragile, Roy builds them himself with local and recycled materials. This is good. Yeah, okay, yeah. and here's another one just like that. <laughs> And they tested them and they said they're working. Yeah, those are the... And they all have cables. Yes. <laughs> Here's the model one. These plastic parts are the ones that you print yourself. Yes, all the black, all okay. the red is printed here. We only buy the electronics mm -hmm. abroad, yeah. It, at WeCenter, Center, it's literally a gold mine. Like many yeah. people are going there scrambling for small parts because they want to repair this other part. Or even just taking down those broken things and repairing them and using them again. Um, this, that's like the general mentality here. Like people don't give up on things once they break down, like it has to break down like 50 times before you surrender it. Designing custom-made objects is easy using 3D printing. First, designs are generated on the computer and then the image is sent to the printer. Anything can be made. Roy has printed models of molecules for schools and medical devices like fetoscopes. This is to listen to the baby's heartbeat yes, when it's exactly. in the womb, right? Yeah. And the idea being um, there are many hospitals out there that have challenges with the supply chain of certain products. Um, so, you know, why not print them? Why not have a 3D printer in a hospital somewhere printing such things? Yeah. And we have this other example of an umbilical cord clamp. The role I see playing here in Africa would be, you know, leveraging new age technology to solve mm -hmm. local problems. We have such challenges with getting things or producing things locally that this will potentially answer all those questions, in that you can produce your unique things easily, faster, um, and uh, less expensive. Roy is cooperating with another company producing the filament for the printers from recycled plastic water bottles. Ecological consciousness in Kenya is growing, especially since plastic bags were banned. So a growing number of companies are combining innovation and sustainability. Others are creating solutions for digital inclusion. Moja is a project to bring free Wi-Fi to Nairobi's buses. The service is ad-financed. Moja is a project of the hardware company Brick. Right now, they have equipped 300 buses with their microservice. Many people who own a smartphone can't really afford data. The connection is not the most stable on the bus, but I'm able to log on. Moja's vision? To supply all of Nairobi and then Kenya with free internet. Brick is specialized in creating hardware made in and for Africa. Imported solutions often do not work as they are not developed for contexts with unstable electricity, extreme heat, dust or humidity. Another one of their projects is KioKit, a box of tablets for school kids, lovingly designed by Mark Kamau and his team to match the demands of kids and the environment they are used in. Happens, yeah? yes, this is the Brick wants to bring the digital revolution from the cities to the countryside, starting with children as their main target group. Often technology is transported from the Western world to Africa, but even the cell phone signal sometimes is a problem. Yeah. So how could we then cache the content in a way that whether there is connectivity or not, the students will still continue learning without disruption. And these are the challenges you face in Africa that we had to design for. The box of 40 tablets connects to a power source, often solar power, so all the tablets can be charged overnight. The box contains a super brick with a router and storage space for learning content, Wikipedia and educational games. Updates are automatically downloaded when charging. 
in some ways you're also doing a little bit of the government's job. If we wait, uh, we're losing a generation uh, without access to quality education and we're losing opportunities that having access to the internet has. The Kenyan attitude is to actually go and do it. KioKit is not the first project equipping schools with technology. But many of the solutions were not specifically designed for this use case. What good is an e-learning app without internet connection? What if the hardware breaks down and there are no replacement parts? Mark Mao takes time for his innovations. He works not for, but with the users of his devices. You see how excited, this is what I like. Yeah, and also that they're showing each other yeah. things, like yeah. sharing their yeah. device. It's, yeah. a, it's a social device, yeah. you know? And that's what I like about tablets, more than computers. The kids picked up technology much faster than the teacher. And to avoid that power imbalance, we let the teacher first of all experience it. And all these factors that are environmental, social and cultural have to be designed for. When I started talking about uh, UX and human-centered design and people were asking, what the heck is that? But then today, uh, I, I feel like the attitudes are changing because old models just don't work. People like Mark solve local problems with innovative solutions by improving learning environments in schools and providing public Wi-Fi. There's little to no state support. This, however, is not stopping any of the social entrepreneurs. Slowly, international investors and corporations are beginning to show an interest in the Kenyan innovation scene, but there is still a lack of finance for startups. Next stop, Rwanda. Over 20 years after the genocide, Kigali has become the poster child of a modern African city. People have access to health insurance and education. The government is marketing Rwanda as the hub in Africa for startups and digital innovation. I'm meeting Aphrodis, manager of the state financed innovation hub K Lab. What we are doing now is to make sure we prepare the next generation of entrepreneurs. Because we focus on IT, we're also doing trainings to empower those young people. And compared to other places, the government in Rwanda is very supportive of its tech and ecosystem. The government of Rwanda has put in place strong institutions that can support entrepreneurs. So uh, like to open a company in Rwanda, it takes a few hours. It's online, it's free. The K-Lab offers co-working space including free Wi-Fi, incubation for young businesses and access to a fab lab. The difference between our entrepreneurs, it's related to our history. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone wants to solve a, a problem. This is the difference. We have a motivation behind that push us to do more and more. One of the entrepreneurs working from K-Lab is Aline. She has received a lot of support to grow her business here. Now she is passing on her knowledge to other young female founders. My main motivation is to be part of the people who are bringing solutions to our country. Yet we have the president who started from somewhere. But we need a young generation who are also bringing in technology, investing in technology in young people to grow our, our society and our economy and I would like to be really part of this journey. To get to my next appointment, I use the SafeMoto app, a company that also grew out of K-Lab. Via SafeMoto, I can order a certified motor taxi, 
one of the most popular modes of transportation in Kigali. Road accidents are the second highest cause of death. Save Moto is trying to address this problem. Specially designed sensors collect and transmit live data from the drivers, such as speed, braking habits and driving style. The customer ranks the driver with 1 to 5 points and pays with the app. The idea to start Safe Motors started when me and Nash, we were uh, just sitting in a bar uh, having a conversation and uh, we discussed that every time you would get on the back of a motorcycle, within the first 10 seconds, you could tell if the driver was good or bad. So we had an idea that what if the customer could be able to know if the driver was safer beforehand. Being a motor driver is a very prestigious job to have because you have the freedom of movement and the freedom of walking yourself. We're very careful about privacy concerns, so you know we make sure that you know this data is not exposed to third parties and it's like uh, only data f that is valuable to us. The app offers extra services for their drivers, such as saving a portion of their income to an e-wallet. My driver Steve has four out of five points, a good ranking. Steve has been working with Save Motors for four years now. What has changed for you? What is different now than being a moto driver before? Safe moto, I have to do it again. 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 To Kizigama, we will have application on telephone. I'm afraid I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to go to the car. I'm going to transfer to the telephone. I'm going to go to the counter. I'm going to go to the car. 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 Nearly one million people were killed during the genocide in 1994, including most of the country's intellectual elite. 23 years later, Rwanda is unrecognizable. New buildings are mushrooming, and the government's marketing strategy is paying off, attracting more and more talent to the tech scene. The country has undergone a reconciliation process. Today, Ethnicity no longer plays a role in political or public life. Differentiating between Hutu and Tutsi is forbidden. Rwanda aims to become a middle-income country by 2020, but it has a long way to go. Private broadband connections are unaffordable for most and thus an exception. The number of mobile phone users is growing rapidly but most of Rwandans do not have access to stable and affordable electricity. The Arid solar kiosks offer one solution to provide people with cheap electricity. There are currently 30 of them in operation. Henry is the CEO of the company, supplying the kiosks to the micro-entrepreneurs. So I, I want to show you a little bit where we are. Um, we're in six district, but the one you're going to be visiting is the Bugesera one. Okay which is uh, the south of Kigali. is about 40, 45 minutes from here. Henry spent many years studying and working in the USA. He's founded several companies, including Arid. The kiosk is powered by solar modules. It offers a number of services, phone charging, Wi-Fi hotspot, access to local content, and selling phone credits. The kiosks also provide access to government services, like tax declarations. Each kiosk creates a job for the micro-entrepreneur running it. Social enterprise is the next step to NGOs. Mm -hmm. I think NGOs have a short-term uh, approach, and I think social enterprise are more long-term. And I think that's the buffer that is needed to solve some of the biggest problems in the world. I believe the private sector needs to be built up in Africa to solve a lot of the problems. That's really where my passion is. And, and my passion is also 
passing the knowledge and the information to the next generation, which is a big problem we have in Africa, where we don't have platform for the younger generation to learn from. And so they learn from the Zuckerberg and they learn from the foreign uh, uh, entrepreneurs, but our local entrepreneurship needs to share that information as much as the, the international one does. Henry is passing on his business skills to his younger employees. One of them is Philemon. He's going to take me to two kiosks today. One of them is the new model being used in Kigali, and one is an older one out of town. The kiosks are deployed around the country and even beyond the borders of Rwanda. Marcel has been running one for four years. Like me, with the charged phone, I leave with Philemon to book a Sarah. Nice. How much did you get? The digital revolution is in full swing. Fiber optic cables are being rolled out across the country. Mobile telephones provide access to market information, education and news, especially in rural areas. In many places, 3G is available, but reliable electricity coverage is not. In Bougasser, 30 kilometers away from the capital city, farming is the main source of income. There are few job perspectives for young people. I meet Floride, one of the first kiosk entrepreneurs. Today, she supports her family with a kiosk, one of the first generation. Not really running that well anymore. very happy that you came to see her. Thank you. In Rwanda, innovation happens out in the open. The government supports civil drone aviation. And Teddy is the first certified drone pilot of his country. His drone images help farmers service their fields more efficiently. seat over that side below the, those bamboos. Mm -hmm. That's where the Nyabarongo River is. And this is a sugar cane Yeah, it's field? a sugar cane plantation here. And uh, we do have uh, some monthly crop monitoring activities for them. Okay. For the agriculture sector, the drone, uh, the sensor that, uh, that is used is called the multispectral sensor. You're able to see things that uh, the natural eye cannot see. What does it feel like to have a job that just didn't exist 10 years ago? It kind of makes you feel valuable. We're living in the future now. When we do take pictures in the, for agriculture farm, uh, you are able to detect diseases in your farm before time, and then uh, you can uh, uh, be able to detect eat any side of the farm that has a problem, and you can take action immediately before something wrong goes on. And it can give you a continual monitoring of how your fields are. So is this a usual work day for you? Is this where you spend, is yeah, this your this, office? Your... This is my office. I spend less time seated down, and I'm always standing up piloting drones in the sun. Rwanda is one of the most densely populated countries in Africa. Teddy's drones also take images of urban areas. His dream? To run a drone pilot academy 
The use cases for drones seem to be endless. These kind of details are normally used for city planning when they want to see the progress that has taken place over the years. The advantage here is that uh, you have high resolution images than um, the old, like, than Google Maps. So the NDVI map is a map that is produced by multispectral cameras. And uh, this map shows you uh, the amount of green matters that are on the ground. Now here I have something that is quite interesting to see. This, this is our first Keris drone. This was the one that we started the business with. And uh, this, this is your the drone, drone baby. This is a drone baby. And uh, the one that got us through. And uh, that's why we always make sure that uh, it's in good shape. Rwanda's economic development is impressive, but its human rights record is not. The government is very supportive of its startups and digital innovation scene. But with such a strong and present government, the power of all the data gathered in open Wi-Fi's and by all the apps is not to be underestimated. The last stop on this trip is Ghana. Ghana is exemplary in terms of democratic stability. In 1957, it was the first African country to declare independence. What's special about the Ghanaian tech scene? In comparison to Kenya and Rwanda, it's decentral. I don't spend a lot of time in Accra. I take the bus to the second largest town, Kumasi. Unemployment in Ghana is high. Many young people do not find jobs after finishing school. Despite the mobile boom, only 16% of people have internet access in Ghana. Its internet coverage is low in comparison to Kenya and Rwanda. Digital divides exist between rural and urban, between young and old, between rich and poor, and between men and women. In Kumasi, I meet my friend George Apaya. George is the founder of Kumasi Hive. George takes me to the outskirts of Kumasi. He wants to show me the largest artisanal market in West Africa. People were saying in Accra that Kumasi is the real tech hub in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I agree with that because Kumasi has that um, ecosystem um, that makes it with the, a tech hub because of the university, um, the informal sector, the local artisans. They had a spread of do it yourself because um, they, um, because of the Shanti Kingdom history, their conquest and all that. So they, they want to do things themselves. Kumasi, 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 Kumasi. Swarma magazine is the largest informal industrial area in West Africa. People are creating a new industry out of waste materials, as well as creating their own jobs. Just like in Kenya and Rwanda, Ghana does not produce, but imports most hardware. In Swarma magazine, new products are created from waste. Over 200,000 artisans, electricians, blacksmiths and welders work in Swami. For makers and hardware innovators, the area is a gold mine for parts. George collaborates with the artisans. They don't have formal education that you might expect, in, but here yeah, they learn by apprentice. The good thing is that if you describe your idea to them, they are able to uh, conceptualize them, build those ideas for them. So you can get really customized pieces. You can, like, I'm guessing the frames for the 3D printers come from here. Exactly, exactly. Um, the meta, heavy meta part of what we do at, at the Hive, we come here to come and do it. So we, we work with them in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Yeah, but yeah, they make all these things for, for you. The fact that here you still have a lot of these handicraft traits and a lot of these skills on an artisanal level. Yeah. And if you combine that with the sort of digital revolution that's so happening and the maker culture, there's a lot of power in that. Exactly, exactly, because then it speaks to the needs of the local people better uh, in, the, in that context. So, uh, it, so yeah, there's a lot of power that can emerge out of it. At Kumasi Hive, I meet Dext. The startup makes science kits for school children. 
all components are made in Kumasi. Their target group is the next generation. The kits include important learning components for future engineers and programmers. Here is the, the sign set, and as we unpackage it, nicely branded. We basically went to his hometown with a bunch of LEDs and capacitors and resistors, and then we just taught the children how to build very simple circuits and then teach them the very simple laws of physics. And then it was exciting what the students came up with at the end of the day. They came back showing us interesting circuits that they had built, useful things that they had built for their rooms and their houses. And we figured, hey, why not um, make this something that can be accessed by all? We visit a school that has been working with the kits for two years. One kit costs around 11 euros, which is affordable for most children here. Each kit is a mini makerspace. vision for the rollout of DEXT across Ghana? Every student in Ghana should have a science set in their box. Um, they should send it to the playground, they should bring it to the classroom, they should play with it in their houses. We want every student to have one. You know, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm like so interested in this product is because when I was young, I just kept wanting some of these things. Um, the first time I ever got components, I had one LED, one transistor, one resistor, and then some batteries, right? So, and that really excited me a lot. And I, I can trace back um, my, my engineering prowess to that moment. Let's identify, yes, can you identify the conducting wire? The, with this one, we are getting light emitting diode. So let's get our light emitting diode. Practical and interactive Sound lessons, three. instead of learning out of okay. a textbook and having the teacher preach to the class. Okay. Don't worry. Follow the instructions. I said you should connect the resistor. Uh -huh. So this is positive terminal. This is positive. So you see, it has to be this way. I ask one of the students what she wants to be when she grows up. A scientist. A scientist? A biological scientist. My mom is a researcher scientist. She works at KCCR. So... I don't know if it's like in the blood or something. How do you feel learning is different if you're doing it from a textbook or working with a kit? Learning from a kit, you really experience how it is. From a book, you just have to, you know, like picture it in your mind. And this is practical. You can touch it and see how it works. So I, I think I like this one better. Access to information is often scarce in rural areas. Pharmaline is one of the most established IT startups in Ghana. The platform sends voice messages in 11 countries and 9 languages, including information on weather, current market prices, and different farming techniques straight to the farmer's mobile phone. This way, even illiterate farmers can benefit from the service. First, <laughs> Hello. Okay. What makes Farmerline unique is the fact that we are the only company that provide information to farmers I mean, through the voice in their own local language. The voice is trusted. In addition to that, we are, I mean, it's a Ghanaian company. Almost every, all the employees are from Ghana. We've experienced the Ghanaian agriculture sector. We, we understand. And then we have that kind of, you know, local touch with the farmers. So we understand them. We develop product not for them, but with them. What has really changed with Farmerline? Farmerline ba ya bra bomuno eden sakrai bebre na ba. Ya hu bre e wose ye duade e. Ene emra e wose ye koyadwuma e wuramu a ye nhia enframa ene nsuo. 
no by no so a conanim. And I'm a new pa or much they are useful. Two hundred thousand farmers and agricultural workers have subscribed to Farmerline. Nearly all companies I spoke to, including Farmerline, see the value in the data they are gathering and plan to make this part of their business model in future. From one of the most established Ghanaian startups, I continue to a company that's still in its test stage. There is a new technology stirring hopes on the African continent, blockchain. The MobiRec team, led by Rhonda, is aiming to connect medical patient files through the blockchain. So far, patient data Hi, only exists Hi, in nice paper to form. You. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for seeing me today. York? Nice to meet you, Dr. Nice York. You Thanks for having me. Okay, and then come back some. So if you take this one, for instance, looking at it for a number of time, it makes the paper torn. So it's better to have the digitized form so that you can easily access it everywhere at any time during the day. That's it. MobiRec is a blockchain application for digital patient records. The data is not just saved on one computer, but distributed on many. Data on the blockchain is encrypted. Every data entry is recorded so that the data cannot be changed or manipulated. Rhonda takes me to the first paper-free hospital in the city. Thank you very much. It's incredibly quick. Thank you. So, show me to the doctor's room. I hope you're going to find I'm healthy. Right, so on this interface, I can see your picture and I could continue from the details that I want to enter. You're developing it together with medical professionals like yourself, but okay. also with some of the patients. So we've done market research to understand what are the needs of the individual. So they need to be have access to their medical records as conveniently as possible. They want to have access to their doctor as easy as possible. So we've done that market research part of it. In terms of their input, we're going to be doing um, the beta testing once we've developed the first phase of the app. Would it be like make sense for you to even have funding from a private sector or more from a public sector side? There's definitely the aspect of social good that's being done with this app. There's also the business side of the app as well. The data that is being collected can be used to make good business decisions for these health, institu health institutions. It was very interesting to be able to see um, how blockchain is being used in health and a lot of the time it's being used for health records because it is incorruptible, because um, it can't be tampered with. So it's a safe way of storing patient information. So that's what, how we got familiar with it. Many startups are creating innovative blockchain applications, not just in the health sector, but also for land registry and transparent governance. I travel back to Rwanda. Once there, I meet many people that I've gotten to know over the last few weeks and whose ideas have inspired me. Reunion at an international tech conference. This is where startups and large corporations meet to talk about digital topics of the future. Many no longer want to wait for their governments. They'd rather take development challenges and societal issues into their own hands. You all come from different political backgrounds, Ghana, Kenya, and here in Rwanda. What's, what's your vision? Where are things going to go? I would say for in Ghana, <clears throat> the government is uh, gradually understanding how they can work with um, innovators. Um, it has always then be innovators are here, we are there. Um, so I think that scenario is changing, the story is changing a bit, and they are coming <coughs> forward to engage with us. The good thing they are trying to put in place those the policies or those institutions to support entrepreneurs. What I want for Africa will be that in the next years, we become more of um, not just um, 
consumers of technology, but more also for um, producers. Energy is there, the vibe is there, the willingness is there, the technology is mostly there. <laughs> it's just how they all come together and make it work for the people of this continent or the respective countries. Yeah. It's, we're within reach. We're within reach. I've come to the end of my journey. I've gotten to know many different personalities and facets of the African startup scene. I'm impressed by the ingenuity and inventive spirit that I've seen, as well as by the many innovative social projects that have the potential to serve as an alternative to conventional development cooperation. In Kenya, impactful projects that focus on sustainability and local needs and wants. The more we have that uh, demand, and the, the more we show the capacity to actually produce high quality hardware here in Africa, then hopefully we can start opening minds. Rwanda, many startups focus on social and central development issues. However, even here, innovation friendly regulation and financial support are often lacking. Unfortunately, the majority, 90% of all the money still goes to NGOs, and there has to be a shift. Ghana, young entrepreneurs do not want to wait for slow governments to act. They want to contribute to the development of their society. You basically had to do it yourself, right? So that is being an entrepreneur. So I just felt that, okay, hey, let, let's start something. Let's start something. Right.